Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming out today. And I'm very excited about moderating this panel with some really amazing artists um, in the field and beyond. And I actually want to start off by very briefly introducing um, them. So we have here Tali Hinkes from Lovit, which was uh, established in 2001 as a collaboration between Tali and Kyle Lapidus. Their work has been uh, shown internationally in galleries ranging from Postmasters and Bitforms in New York and uh, the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts and Jewish Museum in New York, but also at the New Museum, ICA London, so widely exhibited. And Lovit basically made their name with, as the uh, title of the collaborative suggests, Low Video and Glitch. So we're going to hear from uh, Tali. Also here we have... Um, Tommy Mintz, who received uh, his degrees from Sarah Lawrence College and CUNY in Queens and is an assistant professor of photography at uh, CUNY Kingsborough. And his work has been also exhibited locally, nationally and internationally at um, various kinds of venues and really explores aesthetics and concepts of street photography, collage mapping and digital culture. And uh, most recently, he has been working on his automated digital photo collage, an algorithm that analyzes sequential images for um, differences and creates collages. So we're going to hear from Tommy. Then uh, we have Paul Miller right next to me. Um, DJ Spooky hardly needs an introduction. You know, very well-known composer, multimedia artist and uh, writer. So um, you may be familiar with some of his works, his 2018 album, DJ Spooky Presents um, Phantom Dance Hall, which uh, debuted at, as number three on Billboard. And his multimedia performance piece, Rebirth of a Nation, is also very well known. Paul also currently is an artist in residence at Yale. And we're going to hear more from him. And uh, last but not least, because she's very involved <laughs> in the NFT space, is uh, Giovanna. And let me, oops, I'm losing. Right, so um, Joanna has been, is an artist and curator and really a, an NFT and blockchain advisor who has worked with uh, many startups to help them getting things off the ground. And um, she ut utilizes AI generative apps and glitch software and um, open data images for various series. She has been creating among them uh, Trans Utopia and uh, Trans Omni Nation. So I'm very excited about hearing from all of them. I just want to kick it off with a few remarks about Web3 and the art landscape. I think there are many challenges we are facing, many misunderstandings we're facing, and uh, hopefully we can tease that out a little bit and then continue the conversation with you. So when we're talking about Web3, I've... Um, Meeting people coming from two camps, uh, one of them understanding Web3 really as a new form of the web that will be driven by the blockchain, and then others who are uh, coming more from the developer angle and understanding it more comprehensively as something involving the blockchain, metaverse, AR, etc., so there's a little bit con of confusion in that terminology. As you all know, we have experienced a massive uh, shift last year with the NFT uh, boom that happened. But NFTs also have been around since 2014, when Kevin McCoy and Emil Dash did a presentation at the New Museum for Monographs, Monetized Graphics, which were really meant to give artists an opportunity to sell, resell, uh, sell their works. We also have been uh, seeing a lot of experimentation with the blockchain as a medium. It was in 2017 that Further Field in London already published a book, Artists Rethinking the uh, Blockchain, 
And what happened last year, I think, was the start of a bit of confusion because what we're seeing in the landscape is mostly JPEGs and little video clips hung on the blockchain. And that is equated with uh, digital art. But digital art has a long, long history, more than 50 years. It has been collected. It has been sold with traditional certificates of authenticity in the six figures. So we're navigating a space here where uh, there's a lot of comp confusion about what constitutes art. For me, as a curator, I'm the curator of digital art at the Whitney Museum. It's most interesting to see artists using the blockchain as a medium in generative ways. For museums, it's much less interesting to look at JPEG derivatives of massive XR works they already have in their collection or they're about to acquire. And um, it will be very interesting to see how things develop. Uh, a lot of work still needs to be done when it comes to smart contracts, for example, which are not up to uh, the museum level. So on that background, um, Tali, why don't you kick it off with your experiences? And then we hear from um, Paul and Tommy and Giovanna, since she's most involved in this landscape, I think um, she will be a good transition into the discussion. As Lovud, we've been working together for over 20 years, and actually our work primarily uh, originated with revisiting uh, analog synthesizers and analog instruments 20 years ago, which were already then kind of 20 years dated in terms of it was not the current most recent technology. But what we did is, as younger artists at the time, we said, wait a second, there's this whole other way of doing uh, digital art, media-based art, moving image. And so we basically went back in time uh, and rebuilt these analog synthesizers to create work that was, for us, was very personal because we made our instruments by ourselves. It's a lot of hardware. Some of the, I have two pieces in the show if you wanted to see. So the patterns in uh, these prints are made with uh, these analog instruments. So for um, for me, for us as Lovid, it's always been very important for us to not only uh, create work, but in some sense, be part of the systems that make our work. And so that can mean technically uh, building software or hardware, but also continuously thinking of how do we distribute our work. So for someone working in um, time-based media, to just expand the term of digital art to other uh, you know, electronic arts in general, uh, it's always the question. Our work has been centered a lot on performances and live events and screenings and and installations uh, so for you know for the longest time I, I just the idea of collection is not always uh, not just um, it's just not a part of the has not been a part of the conversation for us because it was a lot of time centered about ephemeral things and experiences that you have to sort of be there and a lot of the work that we do even and when they take a form of an object has that um, the question what stays and what how can we capture a moment, a fleeting moment, a technological experience, being on the internet, how can we capture all these feelings with a physical object? Um, so this is a little bit, so I really do come from the, you know, video and I've worked with many institutions. Uh, I, my single channel works are uh, distributed by Experimental uh, Art Intermix, EAI, that are a big catalog of video art and, you know, I've done exhibitions, etc. Um, and so, uh, and I, and I really do my best to be very um, to be very mindful and have a lot of intention of what work is distributed in what way. And so with the big boom of NFT started, you know, we're close friends with Kevin. We've heard a lot about it. We're very involved in, you know, work is in New York City. So obviously the conversation of blockchain has been around us, but we haven't really participated in it. And so um, the first thing that I, I was just kind of absorbing, taking it all in, seeing all the kind of chaos that was kind of February 2020, I want to say, I'm not sure the dates exactly. And so the first piece that I um, uh, created the biggest body of work that we have until now with NFTs is a series called Hugs on Tape. And it was a response to the pandemic, but also a lot of what I saw in terms of uh, what type of work was uh, presented. And a lot of it was, I saw that it was this kind of feeling of solitude. You know, we were all alone, artists making kind of self-portraits or figures that are seem very uh, solitary. And so because of our experience in performances and really doing things 
with people, uh, which is always the most inspiring thing for me. The series Hugs on Tape is um, a series of NFTs or digital, digital animations that have been distributed as NFTs. And they are, originate from a uh, kind of crowdsource. I asked various people to send me videos of a hug uh, and they send it. At the time, people were just in their pods, so with family, with loved ones. And then I reanimate them uh, really kind of almost by hand using patterns from our um, our digital, our analog synthesizer. And so distributing these hugs um, on the blockchain and on social media became this, I mean, I kind of half jokingly called it like social emotional tokens because, you know, there's social tokens is something in the, in the Web3 space that is interesting to me. So it's the idea that you can kind of distribute um, burst of joy, a connect connectedness when in the time of isolation and the series continues because um i'm sort of not done talking about hugs there's a lot there so uh i hope you check it out at some point um and then i just want to briefly before i don't want to take too much of time but so uh now go, the next step for me is thinking more about web3 what are really the potentials with that uh christian mentioned a little bit of um, using art that is that exists on the blockchain. So we are for the first time expanding from our analog instruments that are generative to doing gener generative pieces uh, with platforms. Um, so they, um, we're working with uh, a platform called EAT Works. It's a, a company group. Uh, we'll be kind of engaging conversation with them. The interesting thing about Web3 that I see happening uh, is that places like EAT Works or other platforms in, have kind of want to learn from the experiences of web one web two not repeat the same mistakes and in many cases they want to place artists in the center of their development and research experience of how we think about experience as it's transmitted to each other so to me at least the oldest technology we have is storytelling um if you go to the lascaux caves in france if you see any of the oldest paintings human beings have ever made there's a trace of that human intentionality to convey meaning and I think right now, especially as we move further into a climate crisis, um, the you know, technologists are, tend to have a very utopian vision of how technology relates to the world around us. But obviously, say, for example, to make a Bitcoin which causes a tremendous amount of pollution, causes a tremendous amount of energy consumption. So there's always these latent um, and ancillary um, after effects to technology. And so it's never neutral. Um, so the work I have in the exhibition is called Textpressionism. It's in the museum right now. Um, I work with robots uh, while I'm going to be at Yale. The robots are making my paintings. And what I'm doing is sending them um, a series of quantum physics equations, uh, mainly based on Schrodinger and a couple other major theoreticians in the 20th century. And if you think about what makes the 20th versus the 21st century different, it's not that we have new stuff, because most of the stuff we're using for computers and stuff comes out of World War II. Um, and if you think about it, World War II was kind of an information warfare. Um, for example, Alan Turing, who's generally considered to be the inventor of the computer, um, we really need to update the way we think about these kinds of networks that surround the creative act. And that's kind of what I'm working on uh, for the series of projects that the painting that's in the ex exhibition is kind of uh, related to. All right. So I also think we're in the middle of a crisis of representation. Um, if you think about it, the physical world versus the digital world. Where is the overlap? Most people spend more time with their cell phones than they do with other people. And on top of that, the data that's coming through um, your kind of cell phone and re-engineers your brain at every level. There's a lot of studies that show um, stuff like TikTok, stuff like uh, Instagram. These are all addiction engines. And what they do is they monetize your attention and keep you on the platform. And that's how their business model works. So as an artist, I'm very intrigued with how art, and finance, and perception overlap. If you think about it, um, most of this is speculation. Um, if you think about it, what is an NFT except just kind of a condensed speculation on the value of something in the near future? So too with the futures market, so too with the stock market, uh, so too with the value of any kind of painting or sculpture or whatever. So as we move further into the 21st century, um, we're moving into more and more etherealized cultural space. Um, and that's where, to me at least, art has a really good uh, position to, ch to leverage change and how technology surrounds us. Um, the problem with the 21st century isn't that uh, there's a scarcity. In fact, one could argue, I'd love to put this out there, um, anything that can be digital will be digital. So uh, the social networks around us can be quantified, our interactions with our fellow human beings can be quantified. Uh, you know, whatever you do, 
trust me, they're going to be working on trying to digitize that. So how does art um, fit into that kind of narrative structure? Um, to me, at least, this is one of the most pressing questions of the early 21st century. And considering we're here um, at a conference about Web3 and the idea that people are moving into these kinds of cultural spaces, metaverses, and so on, the digital kind of content that we generate, the, the digital trace that we generate, uh, with every interaction with every network around us, whether it's uh, LTE for your cell phone, um, whether it's the, the data networks and uh, servers that used, uh, are used for Facebook or Instagram and so on, all of that is a relational aesthetic and things can be changed. Data is never permanent. In fact, it's always radically changing. Um, so I'm a big fan of this idea of impermanence. I'm a big fan of how this notion of how digital culture is kind of moving us further and further into a world where what Marx would have said, all that is solid melts into the air. That's a famous phrase from Marx, uh, Das Kapital, if, you, if anyone's into that, from the, ninth, the, the good old 19th century. Um, so fast forward to 2022, we're coming out of the pandemic. And during the pandemic, so many people um, pivoted to digital immersive media at every level to try and re-engage their social uh, space. And I think that anyone in the audience, you can relate to this because we had a sense of disassociative context. Um, and so the tension between context and content, how we think about that, that's what, again, is being monetized for billions and billions of dollars every day as we move further into the 21st century. Um, so I want to just kind of riff on that for a moment. But when you think about current projects, I always want to make sure that the audience realizes that this is art is one of the most powerful tools human beings have to leverage change. Um, and to me, at least, there's a very famous phrase uh, from the, Sa the former minister of oil in Saudi Arabia. He said uh, the, the Stone Age didn't end for lack of stone. It ended because people had better ideas. And we're now in this kind of uh, kind of a transitional point. Uh, I'm a big fan of people like Marshall McLuhan on one hand. But I'm also a big fan of someone like Gavin Wood, who's the who's the co-founder of Ethereum, and he coined the term uh, Web3. Uh, and so uh, when he was working on Ethereum and also his other uh, blockchain uh, project called Polkadot, Ethereum is very different than Bitcoin. And the way it is is because you're thinking about a platform of applications. Uh, Bitcoin is essentially uh, a product of someone who we don't even know exists, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. And he's a fictional character for all we know. So I'm fascinated with that because it's it's this currency that came out of nowhere and that's a mathematical series of engagements. Um, it's anonymous, but it's still traceable at every level. And the person who created it, we're not even sure exists. I mean, it's very 21st century. And so it's a great way of thinking about things. So long story short, um, I'm going to be kind of riffing on that for the next series of uh, art projects um, I'm working on. Most of the work I'm doing with right now is thinking about these kinds of areas both in sound and art as we move further into these digital networks. Um, if you get a moment, I'd love to encourage you, please check out the painting inside. It's called, uh, you know, it, uh, basically all things being equal, ceteris paribus. It's a Latin term. Um, and everything, it looks like it's a hand done painting, but it's actually a group of robots that were responding to uh, quantum physics equations. So there we go. Or virtual world that we've all been sort of pushed into over the last two years. Um, <clears throat> I'm also one of the artists in the Texpressionism exhibit, and Texpressionism is something that came about during this pandemic time. Artists were isolated and unable to get together physically, which gave us time to start to gather um, on Zoom, uh, talking about each other's work virtually. And I feel like that opened up a lot of connections that were um, very uh, powerful, but also very ephemeral. Uh, and that's a, a really interesting place to be as, as an artist. What are we generating? How long is it for? What are we, who are we making it for? Um, was always sort of very defined. You have a thing you're making, it's going to be permanent. It'll, you know, stay around after you're dead, right? Um, and it's always in a place, in a museum that people can go and visit. Now we're working in these spaces that are yet to be defined, you know, whether it is VR or AR spaces, or it's just uh, a slideshow on your phone. Um, it opens up really a, a, a whole bunch of new questions about what are we making, for who, for when, and, and why. Uh, so um, I've been working digitally for over 20 years as well, um, thinking about um, what is the original in a digital 
artwork. Um, and there's always a translation. When So I have um, two dye sublimation on aluminum prints in the, in the show currently. And that translation from the original digital to the uh, print is, is exactly that, a translation. And now that we have this medium where we're all interacting digitally and um, looking at our own viewports into this digital world, uh, the digital art doesn't need translation to be viewed anymore. And I think that's a fascinating thing where we can take our digital work and just present it as that. So, um, gosh, it's, it's very exciting. And it's very exciting to hear how other artists are utilizing this and, and seeing, um, and I encourage everybody both to see the physical show here, um, but also join the Texpressionism uh, salons that meet every Wednesday evening. I saw 2,000 two thousand NFTs last year, but I paint things in age three or five, but I mean, no one really cares not until I start to create NFTs. So what I think about NFT is, is truly decentralized. No, no matter how old you are, how young you are, you can do it everywhere with your mobile phone, your tablet, and you can showcase everywhere with the augmented reality, you immerse into the everywhere the environment. And also, um, like, this is a, the, the physical pen that I already sold the NFT. Um, so I made a lot of a physical products based on NFT. So this is why we are come from Web2 space, we jump to Web3. And it's so funny that the, on the one hand, that um, NFT is a smart contract, um, non-fungible token. That's like, a, I see all these possible, possible things that all the creator, you can prove you are the creator. You're, you're, this is authentic. And while you can also get more idea when you create more paintings or image, a video, or like a music loop, whatever, you can make that like a physical. So this is a, so exciting that, that we get into the Web3 space. And I feel like this is an opportunity for everyone. You know, everyone can be greater. Everyone can be artists. You know, no matter where you are, and this is, you see art everywhere, and you create art everywhere. And then uh, see if we can take questions down there. Starting with um, some of the challenges that uh, Paul has brought up, uh, you brought up environmental issues. I think that's going to be uh, or is one of the challenges we're facing. There's absolutely no need to uh, create more technologies that wreak havoc on our environment. And this is a top issue for artists, many of them uh, having done environmental work. So they simply will not go on any platform that is uh, proof of work and not proof of stake. And uh, we need some major shifts here. Paul also was the one who pointed out one important distinction. NFTs ultimately are um, certificates of authenticity with a connected smart contract and a sales mechanism. We're using the term NFT art, while art very often is not intrinsically connected to that. And I think one of the challenges, also as G Giovanna points out, challenges and potential is really using the blockchain as a medium. To your point of decentralization, uh, this is the great hope, and it's certainly happening to some extent. Uh, every Web3 developer will also tell you Oh man, you're dealing with so many third party dependencies as never before in developing, you know. So here you have, um, once again, this uh, tension between uh, centralization and decentralization. Finally, another thing that all of you have brought up um, is history. I would encourage everyone to look at the history of the digital medium because uh, it's not like we're entering the metaverse right now. We're in phase three of VR, AR, Myron Kruger in the 70s ultimately did this type of work. We have seen so many ideas fail and I think it would be great not to repeat all of that. Oh, we do. We have a question here from the okay. audience, if that's Wonderful. Okay. That Absolutely. Okay? If All we right. have time for that. All right. Well, this is Jean. We met at our after party yesterday. And Jean is a gallerist. And um, I know that he had a question for the crew. DJ Spooky. Hello there. Uh, question. 
the work that you're doing is, it sounds really interesting. And uh, you talked about art being the most relatable of human connections. And I'm wondering, um, you know, with Web3 and the blockchain and NFTs and using the integration of computers and how you think that can we can get more together or relatable as humans. You, you know, I'm, I'm glad you asked it. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I'd love to also bounce that to the rest of the audience. But when I was a kid growing up, one of my favorite movies was Blade Runner. And um, people tend to forget Blade Runner was set in the year 2020. You know, I'm like, where's all the spaceships? You know, we should uh, have our own robots and replicants and everybody should, you know, uh, be relaxing while the robots do the work. But um, obviously Putin or Russia or Ukraine has uh, some uh, issues there. So to make a long story short, art, um, if you think about it, the, the global climate, climate crisis is part of what I view as hyper consumerism. And what the reason people are being told and sold over and over that we need more of everything and we have to keep consuming and that then drives other market forces, which then drives a fossil fuel based economy and so on and so on. But what's interesting about this kind of conference is that we're, we're taking a moment to, of reflection. Um, to me, art is that moment of reflection. Um, and I pers personally, the climate crisis um, has really brought home that if we don't play our cards right, you know, our, our existence as a species is unquestioned, you know. So uh, it's been fascinating to see. Don't forget the Internet as we know it basically was invented. I know this might sound shocking, but in 1969 at the heart of the Cold War, it was called ARPANET. And so, amusingly enough, the U.S. military needed a method to send messages uh, because if there was a nuclear war, which uh, a good old threat of a nuclear war is always good for innovation. You know, people tend to. Uh, so if you fast forward to Tim Berners-Lee in 1989, he invented the web. I always want to make sure that the audience remembers the web is different than the Internet. So Sir Tim Berners-Lee was at CERN in Switzerland um, and they, they were generating so much data with each experiment. Um, so he, he needed a, way, a method of indexing and organizing that information. And that's where you call hypertext markup language, HTML. 